Humans are a social species. In a social species, the survival and well-being of any member of the group is dependent upon group cohesion. Now, what this creates is a programming from very, very early that if a child does not do or be good or do or be right, then instantaneously there's a threat to their sense of survival or well-being. Therefore, the programming is the only way for you to survive and get your needs met is to do and be good and do and be right. This becomes a rather ironic little twist here because what happens is we start to do things that we would consider good and right, but even altruistic acts, by the way, because altruism is considered to be one of these good things, but we actually do it for purely self-centered reasons. Self-sacrifice is considered to be a human virtue. It's considered to be the ultimate act of altruism, in fact. But what if self-sacrifice was entirely self-centered and self-motivated? A basic definition of self-sacrifice is the giving up of one's own personal interests for the sake of someone or something else's. Now this is where we run into a problem right off the bat, because it's actually not possible to give up your own best interests. People only think it is. What all this adds up to is that it's actually not possible to self-sacrifice. Like it's not at a concept that exists within the greater universe. It doesn't exist. <laughs> it's a complete and total illusion. It's only more or less possible to accommodate other people's best interests into your own best interests. When you do this, however, acting in their best interests becomes self-serving and does not feel like you're giving yourself up in any way. For example, let's say that a person takes the best interests of a specific cause as a part of their own best interests. This person may actually decide to give their life up eventually for the sake of that cause, but doing so we can't actually call self-sacrifice because the well-being or the best interests of that particular cause was so much a part of their best interests that giving up their life is something that actually they perceive to be in their best interests. In other words, the minute that you take somebody else's interests or best interests as a part of your own best interests, there is no such thing as a giving up of your best interests when you act in theirs. The reason that we think it's possible to give up our own best interests for the sake of other people's best interests or wants or needs is because of childhood, <laughs> like most things. What happens is that we're taught very early on that it's really good to give up our needs and our wants and our personal direction for the sake of our parents' wants or needs or for the sake of our siblings' wants or needs. We're rewarded for doing so and punished for doing the opposite. But here's what we don't see. <laughs> Even when we decide to do that, we give things up for their sake in our childhood, we're actually still doing it for self-centered motives. We're doing it for the sake of self-preservation. The only way to keep me safe, see that's a self-centered motive, the only way to keep myself safe or to get my needs met is to give this thing of mine up. So what it really is, is a prioritization. Basically, because we believe it is wrong to be self-motivated, we can't see or admit to the self-motivation behind our altruism. The only reason anyone does anything is because they think doing of it is going to make them feel better. There is no such thing as genuine altruism or selflessness in this universe. Before that makes you depressed, I'm going to go over this truth. I know that I've said it before, but I'm going to say it again. The reason that you don't need to be depressed and thinking that the entire universe is narcissistic then, because nothing is ever done for any other reason than it makes somebody think it's going to make them feel good, is because... It can't be other than that. The reason is, is that the universe, the truth of it, is oneness. There is nothing that's not you. So even when you get to the point where the more and more enlightened you get, you start to recognize that oneness, you will suddenly be motivated towards teaching others, towards helping others, towards altruistic looking acts, because you recognize everything is you. In a universe that is one, you could say that every act is self-centered because there's nothing that's not you. So you have to swallow the truth that there's nothing wrong with self-centered motives, that you can't escape them even if you try, and that the more enlightened you become, the more you experience that everything is you, and so the more motivated you become to do things to increase the well-being of quote-unquote others. But you won't really see it or feel it as altruism because you see the self-service in all your actions relative to others. To use an example, 
Most people look at Jesus' death on the cross as a sacrifice. That's the story people tell about what he did, right? But Jesus, if he was an enlightened being, wouldn't actually see it this way. Because you got to think about what he actually considered to be in his best interest. Now, if he took humanity as a part of himself, acting in the best interest of humanity was actually his best interests. So he would have actually seen it as something that was in his best interest to do, not a sacrifice or a letting go of something. Basically, he would have seen the risk of being crucified as a risk he would have to take in accordance with a prioritization of what mattered most to him specifically. There are times when people find that the loss of their own life in the name of something they believe in would make them feel better than living out of alignment with their own values and beliefs. This is part of what makes people so fascinating and inspiring. There are times that what we call self-sacrifice, but that is actually not, can be a free and loving choice. And there are also times that what we call self-sacrifice can be morally reprehensible, a disowning of one's own free will, and also abusive. We could debate each one of these cases point by point until the cows come home. I'm just going to give you one of these examples so that you understand that um, one form of what we call self-sacrifice, but that is actually not, can be seen as a loving thing. And um, in other cases, it shouldn't be seen as that. Let's imagine that you got a kid, and this kid is sick, and so you decide to cancel your tennis match to stay home and take care of the child. Now, assuming that you have taken the best interests of the child as a part of your own best interest, you will actually see it as prioritizing you to stay home with your child, assuming that you're not going to hold it over the head of your child and guilt them for why you stayed home to take care of them in the first place. That could be seen as a loving display of what most people would call self-sacrifice, but that is actually not. But today, for the remainder of this episode, what I want to highlight is, let's say, the more out-of-alignment forms of what we currently look at and call self-sacrifice, but it is actually not self-sacrifice. <laughs> uh, how self-sacrifice can become incredibly destructive and should definitely not be seen as this valued trait within society. One, self-sacrifice can be used as an alibi to avoid taking responsibility for the choices you make in your life specifically. How does this look on a practical level? It looks like somebody who takes their own personal compass and throws it out the window for the sake of connecting with people, where connecting with that person or meeting their needs would take them away from their due north. This is classic codependency. It's a person who throws away all their other best interests and all their other needs to suit their primary best interest and need, which is closeness and approval and connection with somebody or multiple people in their life. Now, the way that they get this feeling of being close, wanted, needed, and approved of is by serving other people's needs and wants. When doing so does not pay off, and what I mean by doesn't pay off is that meeting the other person's needs and going along with their wants and abandoning all their other aspects for the sake of that connection. When that doesn't pay off in that it doesn't get them the connection they were wanting or the approval that they were wanting or the closest that they were get wanting, or most especially, the recognition and appreciation for their sacrifice, now this person loses their meaning for existing. That quick. Now this is a person who becomes resentful and bitter and angry and feels like they've lost themselves. And it's not even necessarily because they're around somebody who's demanded that. It can be as simple as this is the pattern they're in, and so they just immediately met somebody threw everything else away for the sake of merging with their needs and desires and now hates them for it. They blame other people for the reason that they are not living according to their true wants and needs and purpose. They disown their free will. What they have to swallow is that what they really did was prioritize. They prioritized the feeling of being close, wanted, needed, and approved of by serving other people's needs and wants to the detriment of everything else in their life. And it may not have been a prioritization that paid off. The best example that I can give you of this dysfunctional display of self-sacrifice is mothers. Now, we live in a society where a lot of mothers, once they have children, they automatically prioritize the needs, purpose, desires, everything of their child above their own. So what they're throwing out the window is their hopes, their dreams, their personal needs, their desires, their purpose, everything, for the sake of focusing on the child's life. 
There are many self-centered reasons why women do this that range all the way from wanting to be seen as good by society that considers career-oriented women to take away from or deprive their child, to wanting validation, praise, and gratitude from their child for their quote-unquote service to them. But when a woman doesn't see that they're actually doing this for their own sake, meaning that they're really prioritizing any one of these self-centered reasons, which is why they're throwing everything out when they have a child, then obviously parenting becomes this absolutely miserable experience for these women because they didn't get that sense of closeness that they wanted for as a result of doing that. They didn't get the recognition from the child of their sacrifice. They didn't get, you know, X, Y, and Z. And so these mothers start to hate their own children. They get bitter, they get resentful. It's the list that I went through before. They feel like they've lost their purpose in life, they've lost themselves, and they blame their child for it. Basically, here's where I'm just going to slap you upside the head with a really harsh truth. What women are doing in this particular circumstance is using the sacrifice they do for their children as an alibi to avoid taking responsibility for the fact that they did not choose a life that is in alignment with their actual hopes, their actual dreams, their actual desires, their actual need, and their actual purpose. Two, dovetailing off of this last point, dysfunction number two relative to self-sacrifice within a human society is martyr complex. Obviously, the valuing of self-sacrifice, the belief that it can even happen in the first place, makes it so that people who are martyrs naturally exist within society, and martyrs hurt people. Martyrs are people who have to feel victimized and persecuted and as if they've given up all of themselves and self-sacrificed in order to actually meet a psychological and emotional need of their own. It's an extreme addiction to the feeling of rightness and goodness, like virtue. As such, martyr complex is a coping mechanism. Martyrs sacrifice what does not need to be sacrificed just so that they can see themselves as a good person and be seen by others as a good person. They put themselves in circumstances where they're persecuted purposefully to be in the victim role so that people see them as the good guy because in society we always see the victim as the good guy. They cannot take responsibility for anything where the taking of that responsibility would cause them to feel like they're not a good person. So this means they will blame everyone else for everything in their life. They have to have a scapegoat. What they do is they make everyone around them selfish and a villain so that they can meet their need of feeling like a good guy. Self-sacrifice and being in situations where they can see themselves as a victim becomes a consistent and reliable way to avoid their deep lifelong feelings of shame and guilt. The worse people feel about themselves, the more they tend to try to cover it up by making believe that they are kind, loving, compassionate, caring. Seeing ourselves as a victim who sacrifices ourselves for others removes the need for us to take responsibility for our lives by scapegoating other people as the cause of our pain, failures, and disappointment. Now, people like this, they get actually fed by society. In a society that values self-sacrifice, they can get away with this. Three, self-sacrifice can be used as a form of emotional manipulation. When we see ourselves as a self-sacrificer, we can fall into the role of the noble sufferer. And what we do then is that we use our own self-sacrifice to guilt other people so that that guilt causes them to bend and conform to our will. By doing this, self-sacrifice becomes a way of buying our needs from other people, but it's not a straightforward purchase type of a transaction. Instead, it's entrapment. I'll give you an example. A child did not ask their parent to be born, and yet some parents act as if parenting in and of itself is an act of altruism rather than love. Some parents consider clothing and housing and feeding and giving their child opportunities, which, by the way, can all be called parenting, an act of self-sacrifice. They then hold that over the child's head as a form of leverage. Anytime they want the child to do something, like go to a specific school or get a specific job or marry a specific person or give them money or take care of them when they're older, they just have to remind the child that he or she owes them because of how they sacrificed for him or her over the years. This is actually a form of abusive entrapment. Self-sacrifice can be used as a form of manipulation and control in any relationship. 
For more information about this, watch my video titled Cut the Invisible Strings. Four, self-sacrifice feeds societal dysfunction. You don't have to go very far to see this. Just ask somebody whose family was impacted by a forcible draft for war. Just ask somebody whose life was altered by a suicide bombing. Because both of these things were self-sacrifice. <laughs> now, that may be not applicable to some people. So let's go to a more baseline day-to-day -day level. If we still, as a society, hold self-sacrifice as this kind of a social value, then what we create is a profoundly dysfunctional society. We create a society full of unfulfilled people who use self-sacrifice as a means of manipulation. We create a society full of unfulfilled people who are depressed and resentful for not having followed their true hopes, dreams, and purpose, and who have to engage in all kinds of unhealthy coping mechanisms to put up with their lives. It opens the door wide for people to be stuck in the victim-martyr complex and to blame everyone else and disown their free will and personal responsibility. It blows open the door wide for poor relationships between parents and kids, as well as co-workers, friends, and married couples. Okay, you guys, this is a no-brainer. Society is made up of individuals. If this is how individuals are within society, then it's an absolute no-brainer. The amount of dysfunction and pressure this puts on our healthcare system, on our education system, on our childcare system, on our relationships, on our businesses, and therefore economy. <laughs> you cannot create dysfunction in an individual human and not created in society at large. Hopefully in these examples of destructive self-sacrifice, you can see that self-sacrifice is actually entirely self-serving. So now let's look at this. If we're dealing with somebody who thinks that they are a self-sacrificer in any moment, what's actually happening is that they're unwilling, unable, or unconscious of <laughs> looking at aspects of themselves that are prioritizing between one need of theirs and another need. I'll give you an example. If a mother sees herself as sacrificing her own hopes and dreams for her child, that is a mother who has not owned up to the fact that being seen as a good person or mother by society, of course a society that does not see working women as good mothers, is a higher priority to her than personal career success. So she's making a choice with her free will to prioritize one over the other or to let go of one entirely for the other. If this leads her to an unhappy life, she is responsible for making the choice in response to societal pressure that led her to that unhappiness. A person who feels like they are self-sacrificing is a person who hasn't owned up to what their actual priorities and therefore top values are. And as a result, they're not really seeing that through prioritizing about those values, they're actually making a choice. <laughs> Instead, this is a person that's making all kinds of subconscious choices all day long, but feels like they're not making any choices. Things are just happening to them. You can't lose your free will, you guys. It's impossible. Even the choice to give up a choice is a choice, which is free will. <laughs> so when it comes to um, not seeing that what sacrifice, self-sacrifice is really about is you prioritizing, right? What we have to look at here is the fact that it's really hard for us to admit to certain priorities because those priorities are about certain values. Now, we are taught in society that certain values and priorities are good and right, and certain values and priorities are bad and wrong. So what is a person supposed to do if their particular values, if their personal truth relative to their values and therefore priorities, fall into the category of what society sees as bad and wrong? What happens is most people can't be honest about them anymore, honest with themselves or honest with other people. When it comes to facing your personal priorities and values, what's really hard to face is the shame around it. If you feel that you have sacrificed, you feel that you have given something up because you could not choose that thing that you gave up or prioritize the thing you gave up and feel good about yourself at the same time. You have to face your shame about choosing what you're giving up or have given up instead. Self-sacrifice does not actually exist within this universe. People only think it does. And if human society accepted this, very soon there would be no more codependency. But these acts that seem self-sacrificing can only be in alignment if when somebody does it, there is no hard feelings and no expectations for having done it. It can only be in alignment 
when you take somebody else's best interests as a part of your own, and when this happens, anytime it seems like what you have done is to act in their best interests or act in the name of a personal higher goal, right? And lost something of yours as a result. That's not actually what happened. What happened is that you decided that that quote unquote loss of what was yours is actually more personally meaningful to you or more fulfilling to you. So again, it's your best interests. Have a good week.